Hi guys, it's your science teacher here with another video. This time it is on C5, which is chemical changes. Quite a large topic for you here. However, when you learn some of the rules, uh, it becomes quite a nice topic. I hope you enjoy the video. Remember, if you do, please drop it a like. C5 starts off by looking at the reactivity of different um, metals and uh, you can determine the reactivity of metal by either putting it in uh, hydrochloric acid or water. Uh, you need to remember to control a few things uh, in this practical though. You need to make sure that you'd use the same amount of uh, acid or water and you use the same amount of metal. Um, but this technique, uh, basically, to determine reactivity, all you need to do is count the number of bubbles that come off uh, that, that metal, which, as you can imagine, uh, means that it's not the most reliable of experiments. Um, and you, you can find better ways of uh, determining uh, the reactivity series by doing displacement reactions, which I'll talk about on the next slide. But if you were to draw out an order of reactivity of the metals you need to know about for GCSE, uh, then it would look like this, with potassium being at the top and gold being at the bottom. And you need to know which, what, which order the reactivity series goes up and down in. Now, at foundation level, you probably wouldn't be asked to recall this. However, at higher level, you'd certainly have to remember which uh, metal is more reactive than the other metal. So I've come up with a little mnemonic to help you remember it. It says, please stop calling me a careless zebra. Instead, try learning how copper saves gold. Now you can come up with your own little mnemonic to remember it. However, I quite like that one. Now I said that you could uh, use a more sophisticated method of determining uh, the reactivity of met uh, the metal. And that's by using a displacement reaction. And these are a lot better, okay? Uh, you, you can see conclusively results more easily using this. Um, so if you were to have copper sulfate and add it to magnesium, for example, uh, you can see magnesium is here in the reactivity series and copper is down here in the reactivity series. So magnesium's more reactive. So what you'd see in this reaction is you'd see magnesium displacing the copper and making magnesium sulfate and you'd get a byproduct of copper. Now, uh, it might ask you to say what you might see in a reaction like this. And uh, you're expected to remember that copper sulfate is a blue solution. And um, you know that also copper is a bronze solid. Think about your coins that you have. They, they used to call them coppers uh, back in the day. Uh, they're bronze solid. Uh, so, um, you, you might see a couple of uh, observations during this practical. That blue uh, solution is going to discolorize and you, you might see a bronze solid forming in this experiment. You might say also, why does this happen? Why does this displacement happen? And we can actually explain that by looking at half equations. If we look at the uh, ion of each metal in solution, uh, we, we can explain it using that. So copper sulfate, uh, copper and copper sulfate because sulfate is SO42 minus. Copper has a two plus charge. And the charge of magnesium down here is also two plus uh, in magnesium sulfate. And the atoms obviously don't have a charge. So this is just Mg and this is just copper. They, they do not have a charge at all. So if you look in the reaction, what's happening is copper 2 plus is going to copper and Mg uh, is going to Mg2 plus. Now, to go to 2 plus, you might remember from looking at structure and bonding, uh, when you become a positive ion, you are losing uh, two electrons. So from, from going from 2 plus to 0, you must be adding two electrons and going from zero to two plus, you must be losing two electrons. And basically, magnesium uh, is more reactive because it forms that Mg2 plus a lot more easily than copper. That's why it's more reactive. And um, gaining electrons like this, this is called reduction. And 
losing electrons like this is called oxidation. So this reaction is known as a redox reaction. And a redox reaction is basically where one species is reduced and the other is oxidized. So we looked at displacement reactions and how we can use displacement in order to come out with a reactivity series. Uh, but we're going to see how to use this in a practical uh, sense as well and um, how we can actually extract metals using uh, the reactivity series. Now we can use two elements uh, on this reactivity series really well. We can use hydrogen and we can use carbon. These are two really abundant elements uh, on our planet. So uh, we can use them in order to um, get uh, metals that are found uh, in oxide form uh, because the fact that they're, they're reactive, they react with oxygen in the air and we need to remove that oxygen in order for them to be uh, used. So here I've shown two ways that you can extract uh, copper from its oxide, one using hydrogen and one using carbon. Now, um, we can use this uh, hydrogen technique for copper because copper is less reactive than hydrogen and copper is also less than reactive than carbon, so that works as well. However, hydrogen looks like a better solution because when you react hydrogen with copper oxide, it makes water, whereas if carbon reacts with copper oxide, you make carbon dioxide, which you know is a greenhouse gas uh, and therefore uh, it contributes to global warming. In both reactions, however, the same thing is happening to uh, the copper ion. It's being reduced, okay? Uh, you're adding two electrons and making copper. Uh, so that's happening in both reactions. Now, this would not happen, say, if I used uh, aluminium. I could not do that because, look, aluminium's more reactive than carbon, uh, so it will not be reduced by carbon. It simply would not happen uh, with aluminium oxide you actually have to use a technique called electrolysis, uh, which we will look at in another video of how to extract aluminium. The second half of this topic uh, looks at the reactions of metals with acids and then goes into a bit more detail into uh, looking at acids. Um, now, the, the main reactions we look at is adding the metal to acids or adding the metal carbonate or metal hydroxide. Uh, when you add a metal to an acid, you will always make the same thing, salt and hydrogen. And deciding what salt you make is quite easy. You can just pr uh, apply it to this table. It all depends on which acid you use. So, for example, with sodium, if I add it to phosphoric acid, I would make sodium phosphate as well as my hydrogen. And I could prove I'd made hydrogen too. I could do a squeaky pop test. Uh, that's always what I use to prove that I've made hydrogen. I could use a squeaky pop test. And that basically works by putting a lit splint into a test tube full of hydrogen and observing a squeaky pop. It's important to remember the other ones such as hydrochloric always makes chloride salts, nitric acid always makes nitrate salts, phosphoric always makes phosphates, and sulfuric always makes sulfates. So I'd make a note of that so you, you remember them. And this is the first way you learn about how to make salt. However, as we discussed earlier, a lot of metals aren't found in their pure form, okay? Uh, usually they're found in oxides or in carbonates. So we need to look at how we can uh, make salt uh, using oxides and carbonates as well. Now, I said we'd look now at... Um, when the metal isn't in its pure form uh, and a lot of bases are the oxide of the metal um, so most of them are oxides but bases basically are anything that will neutralize an acid um, so an alkali is a form of a base however the only thing that makes an alkali different to the bases that we're going to look at uh, the oxides is the fact that alkalis uh, will dissolve in water whereas bases, uh, the bases we look at today will not, um, so they're insoluble. So that's the only difference between them. So if you were to look at uh, a reaction of um, copper oxide and add it to sulfuric acid, you would make copper, sulfate and water. Now how you'd carry out this uh, practical, in theory, 
it is like this. It's a four step method. The first thing you'd need to do is add the oxides with a spatula to the acid in a beaker. And uh, in each step, if, you're, if you've got a method question, you always need to explain why. And this is uh, to start the reaction. And you'd always add um, the base in excess to the amount of acid that you've got. Because you add it in excess, what you need to do then is filter out. And this gets ready, rid of any unreactive solid. Uh, any unreacted solid can get rid of. Next, what you need to do is you need to evaporate uh, the water because it's a neutralization reaction. You're going to make water. So you need to evaporate the water off. And um, then the last step is crystallization. So leave on a windowsill to crystallize. And the reason why you leave it on the window to crystallize is because you don't want to evaporate all your products off. You might get, uh, if you evaporate too much, you might get, lose some of your products. So you want to leave it on a window to crystallize. And actually, if the crystallization takes a longer period, you will make bigger crystals, which is always nicer to look at. Um, the only other reaction you really need to remember is that acid plus metal carbonate makes salt water and carbon dioxide. And I didn't mention it explicitly. Uh, acid plus alkali makes salt and water. Uh, we did acid plus base, and I said the only difference between a base and an alkali is an alkali is soluble uh, in water. Um, so I've just done an example reaction here for the carbonate. So hydrochloric acid uh, plus zinc carbonate makes zinc chloride, water, and carbon dioxide. You could test for the carbon dioxide uh, with lime water and lime water goes cloudy if carbon dioxide is present. So you can see whether the reaction has taken place or not. The last thing we're going to do in this video is look at acids and alkalis in a bit more detail. Um, and what makes an acid an acid is the ion uh, H+. And what makes an alkali an alkali is the iron OH minus. Um, and let's look at a strong acid um, like hydrochloric acid. And uh, when you add hydrochloric acid uh, to water, it makes the two ions H plus and Cl minus. And if I compare that to a weak acid such as ethanoic acid, um, it doesn't fully dissociate. Um, that means that it doesn't uh, make a hundred percent the H plus it's a reversible reaction okay it will go back and make itself um, what that's why uh, HCl hydrochloric acid is a strong acid and ethanoic acid is a weak acid because uh, this one fully dissociates and uh, this one only partially dissociates when added to water now uh, I said it was to do with the hydrogen uh, comp concentration well, uh, how does that relate to pH as well? Well, um, if I look at the pH, uh, pH 1 means you have a hydrogen concentration of 1 times 10 to the minus 1 mole per decimeter cubed. And it keeps going down like this. Um, and it's a logarithmic scale. It keeps going down by a factor of 10 each time uh, you, you go down 1 pH. And it goes all the way down to neutral, of course, uh, which is pH 7. Now, because when you've got a strong acid, you assume uh, that you get full dissociation, uh, you can easily dilute it uh, and go down 1 pH each time you d uh, dilute by a factor of 10. And what I mean by that is uh, if you have 10 milliliters of uh, pH uh, one hydrochloric acid, you could really easily make it a uh, pH 2 solution by diluting it by a factor of 10. So if you you could add 90 milliliters of uh, water and that would dilute it by a factor of 10 and then you would now have a pH 2 of hydrochloric acid. Unfortunately, that's the end of uh, C5 chemical changes. If you enjoyed uh, today's video, please uh, like 
at the video and if you haven't already please subscribe to the channel to keep up to date with any videos that are being published.